everyone. This morning we've got Stephen Clark with us. Um, John and I are doing this together. Uh, Stephen grew up in Rhodesia, but left while he was um, still still going to school. And then later he was in the artillery in the SADF. And uh, he was um, involved in the campaigns in 87, 88 in Angola. So uh, Stephen, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking to us. Um, if you could start off telling us a little bit about your life as a as a kid growing up in Rhodesia, and then move on to your uh, time in the artillery. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Um, yeah, it's an honor, first of all, to be here to chat with uh, you guys, especially this channel, uh, The Fighting Men of Rhodesia. Um, so yeah, I uh, born and raised in Salisbury. Uh, I was born in, I think it was called Lady Chancellor Hospital. And um, we grew up in Cranbourne Park, which is like the south side of, of, of Salisbury. <clears throat> I uh, went to Nettleton Primary School and then um, high school, I was in um, Cranbourne Boys. And uh, I think it's a thing with Rhodesians. We identify, it's one of the things we do is we identify ourselves by the schools we attend. It's yeah. always a, a question when you meet a roadie anywhere in the world. It's, it's, it's normally some of the first questions is like, where did you go to school? So, <clears throat> and um, so growing up, the first few years of my life, um, the war really wasn't, it was in very limited areas <clears throat> of Rhodesia. But at a very young age, uh, we knew about it because there was, <clears throat> Rhodesia has this very unique history um, of being breaking away from the British rule and then going on this incredible adventure. And so even as a child, you understand <clears throat> things that um, are happening. And what I mean by that is we had sanctions. So we couldn't get some of the things <clears throat> that were normally easily attained by anywhere, whether it be candy bars or school supplies. Uh, one of the things that I remember in uh, primary school is the quality of the paper <clears throat> was really bad that we would, you know, take your notes and stuff on. And if you could, what you would do when you went down to South Africa on vacation, you'd buy books there because the quality of the paper was better. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the reality that we lived in is you had to make do with a lot less that we would call luxuries in the, in the Western world now. A few years into primary school, the war really started uh, to heat up. So one of the first things that you, you realize is um, normally your parents, um, your, your dad would be called up. My dad was uh, in two brigade. He was a territorial, that's what they called him uh, there. And he was a, a sergeant in, in, that, in one of the uh, companies there. He had actually been uh, a soldier in um, the Malay uprisings and stuff like that in the east. <clears throat> and then he had moved to Rhodesia. He's originally from South Africa. And he moved to Rhodesia, met my mom, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, um, you know, they, they, they got him involved. Early on, I think it was 75, 76, when he started doing tours. So that's one of the things that you, you realize immediately is your dad is going to be away for certain periods of time. And you don't understand really as a child what war is, but you understand that your dad is not there. <clears throat> but again, Rhodesia was so immersed and we, we um, had to become so aware of this war that was happening that you soon realized that it, it wasn't a play thing, it was dangerous. And you, everybody started to adjust their lives accordingly. 
So, I mean, as a young child, uh, then in the early stages, you can say, uh, you know, the cool things that your dad would bring home for you would be, you know, a rat pack or something like that when he would come home. And then I remember my my oldest brother and I, we would be uh, camping in the backyard. And, and, you know, you tear open the, the rat pack and you do the whole nine yards with, you know, my dad giving little pointers there. <clears throat> but again, you're so immersed in this atmosphere. Um, the, my neighbor immediately to the right, he was um, a paymaster at... Um, RLI. Um, so that was just the RLI barracks was uh, the front gate was about one kilometer from my house where I lived. I don't know if John will remember uh, Biddulph Road was I was right off of Biddulph Road. And um, that's where, you know, the front gate for the RLI was. So we had him there. Uh, a very good friend of mine as well in school, her dad was um, a policeman. So she lived about four houses up the road. And <clears throat> he was in the BSAP in um, criminal investigations. So you have all these things going on. And you quickly get uh, acclimatized as well. Your dad's going to be away for a number of months through the year. You have... <clears throat> your neighbors involved in the war. And then plus, you know, you hear these things. And um, so one of the earlier memories, I remember uh, one of my dad's friends was killed somewhere. <clears throat> my dad was normally posted to the Mount Darwin Motoko area. <clears throat> and um, so he was killed in action. So when we went to the cemetery, we would go, you know, he'd always go pay his respects. And um, so he'd give a little bit of stories and backgrounds to this. That's your your day to day life. <clears throat> now, living in Salisbury itself, in the early part of the war, it was should I say not too bad <clears throat> compared to maybe farmers or something in the rural areas, in some of the hot areas of of Rhodesia. One of the things I remember is we we couldn't go camping anymore. We couldn't go to these places <clears throat> and, and that we would normally go camping uh, because it started to get a little bit dangerous. <clears throat> then um, I think it was 1976. I was probably about, I don't know, 10-ish or so. Um, my dad was in the Kariba area and he was deployed there for his time and he was allowed to have visitors. So myself and my mom got on one of these buses that they had there, and we drove up to uh, one of the camps there in Kariba. So we obviously hung out with my dad for a weekend, uh, but we stayed on the base, and I, I, I don't remember it. All I remember, one of the, the cool things is it had um, an Alouette K car was based there, and this was um, really as a kid, to see this thing um, take off and land, watch the pilot and the gunner tech get ready. And they allowed me to get really close and they explained some of the things, you know, the traditional little things, you know, sit behind the gun, sit in the pilot seat. So this was really cool to see, but they were going on you know, live missions. It wasn't fun for them. They were They were going on live missions. So um and then the one day uh was probably the saturday we went down to the kariba dam my mom my dad and myself and you know you see the the sandbags you see the other soldiers deployed around there and it, it was kind of a surreal situation you know because it was a very uh important infrastructure part of of rhodesia for this massive dam but, you know, we were able to take this time as a family, take pictures. And then, you know, my dad showed me they had some of the gates open so you could see the water flow out of it. And so it was <clears throat> very interesting, exciting, really, very exciting as a child to get to, to see this under these special circumstances because there was no other <clears throat> visitors, right? There's no tourists coming to visit the dam or anything. So it was this very restricted area, but my dad was able to get at the same visit. We um, 
you know, I fell in love with the FM because my dad had one <clears throat> and he allowed me to handle it. Of course, it was safe and everything like that. Reload his magazines. Um, he'd show me his webbing and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> he had some of his troops there with him. So we got to hang out with him. And I, I learned all the bad language that we, you know, that they were using. So that was one of those very interesting uh, situations that, that I was aware of. Um, and in primary school, <clears throat> to get back to that, number one, the primary school that we were, I was attending, uh, Nettleton Primary, it, it was a um, named after John Nettleton, who was uh, a squadron leader for 44 Rhodesia Squadron during World War II. And he took part with a bunch of other people in their Lancasters to bomb one of the ball bearing factories in Germany. <clears throat> and he actually was awarded the Victoria Cross. John Littleton was actually a South African <clears throat> that moved up to Rhodesia and become part of this 44 Rhodesia squadron. So again, once a year, we would have this uh, memorial service. And so we had actual Air Force members attend, give speeches. You had um, somebody, you know, playing the bugle. So you're constantly in this uh, awareness of growing up in a war zone. <clears throat> and one of my very good friends, his um, dad was uh, Captain Cooper. John probably remembers him. Yes, he yeah. was uh, uh, an officer in the RLI. And so we would, so now I'm getting a little bit older. So, you know, 11, 12 years old. So we would be able to go to the RLI barracks after school. And that was truly <clears throat> amazing because we got to see, because he, he, him and his dad, obviously his family, they lived on base. And we got to see the RLI troopies doing their thing. So, a lot, you know, depending on the time of the year, it'd be, the, you know, the different intakes. So we were allowed to, in certain circumstances, watch, you know, the recruits go through their paces. I mean, again, one of the very interesting things, like the one time we went to go watch, um, they had the Alouettes come in and the troopies would practice getting on, getting off, do a circle get on, get off, they would practice those drills that they had to learn. Um, they would, we would also watch them sometimes where they were training in the, the swimming pool there and they would jump with all their kit into the swimming pool. <clears throat> They'd have to go across the swimming pool, get out and their you know, drill instructors would do this. So now as a child, you kind of had this amazing front row seat where you could watch all this stuff happen um, it was just an incredible situation, and it, it was it was incredible. We got uh, also like a front row seat because of him when the troopy was unveiled, the monument, and so that was something that we were allowed to go uh, and see, and then we could visit it during you know normal <clears throat> office hours, you can say. Um, so that was always also nice. It was so incredible because you could actually see, um, you know, this in very important part of you know, the RLI history. Um, <clears throat> and I would remember one of the things, the one time we were at one of the fields, because we were playing rugby, just kicking the ball from one end to the other. And these troops came in from the operational area, wherever that was that they came from. It was quite a few trucks that came in and you could see that these were battle-hardened, serious men, even though they were probably very young themselves. But there was, I had an incredible respect for them because you look on their faces, they were very serious. They, you know, they were fully kitted out. <clears throat> and again, as a young boy, to see this, it, it was incredible, you know. And we, 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 because, like you said, he was in charge of training troop, we were allowed to do and witness so much stuff. We weren't allowed near any of the barracks or anything like that, but mainly in the field areas and something like that, we we were we had access. We we didn't even need to be with an adult or anything. So long as we knew the rules, we were able to uh, go and visit them. And um, so again, as a young boy, to watch all this with you know the heroes 
the RLI, you know, everybody knew the RLI. They were they were just such a an amazing they they were in so many of the stories, especially like we've heard now over the years at this channel. And I didn't know your names or anything, but I probably saw so many of you going through that recruitment training and post deployments and stuff like that. It, it was just such an honor to watch that. And um, then, uh, like I said, the school that I went to, the primary school, <clears throat> it was uh, by the main gate for the the, the whole Cranbourne Barracks uh, complex where two brigade was. So we could actually cut through there. And for me, which affected some of my decisions later in life, um, I was always interested in all the different types of army trucks and stuff, the Land Rovers and all that, that, that special um, things that you used to see there. And so you could get to go really close to this history where other children, <clears throat> other boys never had that opportunity. I had this opportunity. <clears throat> and, you know, as the war uh, progressed, so you're talking you know, 77, 78, 79, you could see the seriousness of the country change. Like, for example, my dad started to be deployed much more. So you, as a child, you start feeling the strain on the family system. But then you kind of, the that you have with other children in school is because their dads were experiencing the same thing. You know, they were in different units. Our teachers, a lot of the teachers were BSAP reservists. So during the school holidays, they had to be deployed. So they would tell us their things that they would see. One of the things that uh, I will, you know, always remember uh, growing up there is even though we were in this wartime situation with a lot of danger and all that, my parents allowed us, I could get on the bus and go into town, Salisbury proper. <clears throat> my dad worked at a place called Merton's Motors. And they were an auto, auto parts supplier. And so we could go in on the bus and then we'd come on with him. What they would have and what we wanted, my brother and I, I remember, is they would have these, especially in the later years, these coordinate search where they'd block off streets, the BSAP. And then they would search everybody and that whole thing. Because uh, if you remember, the Woolworths bombing kind of started that where the Woolworths was bombed and then they started, you know, doing the uh, searches of your bags and stuff where you were um, going into department stores and they'd have these coordinate searches and you could, you know, there was an interesting thing as a child, again, to witness, you know, you, you have to stop and people go through, you know, your mom's purse or something like that, <clears throat> ask you a few questions, but, you know, they definitely were trying to, as they, I think they called it, beat the bomber. Uh, was the slogan. And um, so you have these things. And uh, uh, opposite where my dad used to work, there was one of the BSAP uh, offices. I don't remember which one exactly. And so you, th but that had nothing to do with the war per se, but you could see the criminal element. So the BSAP, they weren't just busy fighting terrorists. There was crime too, you know, stealing, whatever the case may be. And so you got to see this. The other big thing that we as children was exciting, again, probably not understanding the true nature of the danger, was by that time, if you, you know, my, a lot of my mom's family and some of my dad's family lived in South Africa. So you'd have to, you know, drive from Salisbury down to Bight Bridge and you'd have to go in a convoy, right? And so as a child, this was an amazing thing. You, you line up, you go to the front, and it's normally it was um, policemen. They tell you all these things to do, and you get in this long line, and you drive, and you stop, and you drive, and you stop. <clears throat> and uh, it was exciting as a child, and, and sometimes you just don't understand. Um, for example, one of the years, for whatever reason, this is unlike my parents, we were we were late. So we were, you'd have to get outside of Salisbury. I think you joined the convoy. The first one was at uh, Beatrice. And so we were late. 
And so my dad says, okay, we'll, he made the decision. We'll push from Beatrice all the way to Fort Victoria to catch the convoy there. And, but we were late again. We had this all beat up kind of Austin A30 or A whatever it was. It was an all beat up car. It had like 80 horsepower with all of us in it. So it really couldn't go very fast. And uh, so we missed it again in Fort Victoria. And they said, it was like maybe eight o'clock in the morning. And they said, well, the next convoy goes at 12. <clears throat> so we, we didn't want to do that because then you'd get through the border post late. And so we'd be late into South Africa. So my mom and my dad kind of discussed and they said, okay, let's, let's go for it. We'll try. So again, we were by ourselves and we left Fort Vic and we were going to drive down to by bridge and maybe try and catch the convoy. What was it? New Anetsi or Rutenga? I think down there somewhere where they would stop <clears throat> and catch the convoy there. And I remember we had just left, um, Fort Victoria, we, we had uh, gassed up and everything. And you go through some mountain, well, hills, not really mountains. And on this one hill to the side, <clears throat> I was sitting behind my dad, three terrorists right there on the side of the hill. And for whatever reason, you know, because they had their AKs and their SKSs, they just looked at us and smiled. And we got through. It was a miracle of God or something because. They just let us go, and we were able to catch the convoy further down. I think it was one of the stops they did, and um, that was amazing because I could see him, my dad. He was really sweating bullets there because I was like, hey, look there. Hey, look there, and, and you could see them, and it was scary for them. For, for me and my brother, we just like curious and looking and all that kind of stuff. Those are the kind of uh, things that we uh, experienced growing up. and. Um, the other thing that uh, I remember was um, fuel rationing. So I was in charge of taking care of all the little coupons. You know, you'd get them once a month. I don't know. I forget how many we would get, uh, depending on what you did or what type of car you drove. I don't know how it worked. but um, And then I could clip them for, for my parents. And then, you know, you go to the, the petrol station and you'd fill up your car and and today, it's, you don't even think of something like that now. You just drive up to the pump, you fill up, and off you go. But there, um, these were the things that we saw as children. You, you don't have a lot of the stuff <clears throat> that, say, my cousins had in South Africa. Um, but we were content. We were happy about it. And um, we just made do. It was an incredible... <clears throat> thing you know in Rhodesia we started recycling before recycling was cool I remember that uh, we, we would recycle a lot of plastics and glass bottles and stuff like that and just so that you know there was no waste and even to this day I don't like that waste um, just because there wasn't an abundance it's not that we were definitely not in my family poor or anything like that but we definitely were aware that there was certain things, you know, like I said, we finally got a, upgraded to a Peugeot 404 station wagon <clears throat> from this old Austin that we had. And that was a huge upgrade, especially when my younger brother was born. We had all this extra space, but there were still cars that were made in the 50s and 60s that we had to drive. You know, and my cousins, my uncle and all that in South Africa, they had the latest and greatest of whatever the offering was there. It, it was you just learn to make do uh, with a lot less that, that we had to do with. In primary school, one of the other things that we, we realized that the war uh, was making everything unsafe is they would do like, I think in South Africa, they, you know, they, we call it their uh, a felt school. And it would be down in uh, around the Fort Victoria area, Lake Kyle. And that was all canceled. We couldn't do those kind of things. Um, my brother and I, we would uh, go play, I think it was called the Makambuzi River, which was just to the north of where we lived. And it was a wooded area. <clears throat> and it got to the point as well uh, at a time where, you know, my, my mom started worrying where we were, you know, needed to be close, you know, closer to home. And 
like the one time my friend and I, we got on our bicycles and we went to one of the black townships to go play, uh, you know, foosball, the uh, soccer with the, with the black kids. And when I got back, I was in so much trouble because I didn't realize, you know, that, you know, these areas were, especially late in the war in like 78, 79, they were, you know, the terrorists were that close. They were in the cities. They were definitely in the townships. And I've since heard from uh, watching these uh, episodes on the fighting men, how close it was to Salisbury. Salisbury <clears throat> was kind of protected for many parts, many years of the war, especially as I was growing up. Uh, you had that freedom in the city to move about. But later on, uh, it, it really became something that you had to be, at, you know, pay attention to, not drive around too much at nighttime and stuff like that. As I remember uh, one of my mom's friends, I think, I forget now the, the, the suburb that she lived in, but um, right where they lived, <clears throat> one of the cross sections, they um, a terrorist had set up there in on the ditch by the side of the road and was firing at houses, firing at cars. And so, you know, the war really came into the city then. And so we really started not being out and about and paying attention. Just like even at school, we would not uh, go on field trips around the area because or you'd have to have very special permission for the teachers and all that because again you know the area became uh so unsafe <clears throat> and then um when i went to high school um this is when things started you know heating up and wrapping down uh then you know we had it became zimbabwe rhodesia um and then everything moved towards the, you know, as they call it, you know, negotiated settlement. <clears throat> and at that time, my parents were really concerned about the state of the country. So for December, uh, they decided we would go and stay with my <clears throat> aunt and uncle in Johannesburg. And so my brother, my brothers and I, my younger brother was really little at the time. Um, they put us on a plane. <clears throat> so this was kind of cool. It was the first time I flo uh, flew uh, in the uh, Aerodesia Viscounts. And um, what was interesting about it is it was a nighttime flight, and I think on purpose. And it flew very low level. <clears throat> and it didn't have the, the nice colors, the white and the gray and the blue of the old Aerodesia. They painted the Viscounts in a very a dull gray color, and I believe it was to do with the Sams that had shut down two of the Viscounts in the previous years. And uh, so I remember we flew at very low level as we exited out of Salisbury. <clears throat> and then somewhere out there, you know, we went to altitude and then flew safely to South Africa. And when we came back from that, <clears throat> that's when, you know, we had the elections that year in 1980. And I just remember, as a young teen now, your world started to collapse. And I think it was worse for the older people. But this country that you had grown up in, you loved, we had, you know, desires of, you know, going to high school, college, whatever you want to talk about, joining the military. Obviously, that was a thing. <clears throat> and it was all coming to an end. I did understand that the end was not going to be good. Right, we we had, and history's taught us now a very bad president that became president of Zimbabwe. He won the election, and, and we realized that this was going to be a, a really bad thing. And I remember <clears throat> the day of the elections, and I was in high school, and I believe it was the RLI because they were so close. They came, and in a lot of schools in Salisbury and strategic points, they they deployed soldiers. And uh, I remember seeing the troopies as we went into school and we waved to them and they waved back. And one of the, it was a Unimog, uh, on the back of it, it had a, um, like a one of five millimeter recoilless on it. And 
we knew there was this impending major shift in the way we would live our lives. Then obviously Mugabe and his party, they won the elections and Rhodesia didn't exist anymore. <clears throat> and, and even as a child, we realized it was over. And this we had this weird feeling of you know regret, sadness, all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> I remember when they announced it, some black people that had worked for people, you know, in their houses that were, you know, maids and, and garden boys and stuff like that, running through our suburb and just, just chanting, <clears throat> I guess, songs and stuff like that, victory songs on their part. And it was really scary and and just a sense of doom came over us. I remember then also seeing a lot of the, what we called them then, and they became part of the structure. Uh, the terrorists now were in the way we would see them, where, you know, that was normally in the operational areas. And we'd see many of them. And you'd see them, and they had a look on their eyes. It wasn't pleasant. It was like they really looked down on us. Then the schools started to get integrated, which in and of itself was not a problem. But I remember one of the senior black boys that joined, uh, he said, you know, we're in charge now and you're going to do what we're going to say. So in all that, I believe parents made the decision like so many other Rhodesians is that this was probably not the best place to raise children and bring children because my brother was about to finish high school. I think, yes, he had finished high school. And uh, so they decided that it was time to emigrate. And in 1982, we moved down to South Africa. <clears throat> but the cool thing before that, because the war had stopped, my, you know, my family and all of us, we liked to camp. And so at least we were able to go to Kariba again, to uh, the Zambezi River. We could go to all these places, do camping, go and see the country that had been closed off because of the war. Uh, so that was a very special <clears throat> experiences that we had uh, there. And on the subject of Kariba, just a, a trivia, bit of trivia fact. Um, Kariba Dam was officially opened yesterday, 62, 62 years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday was the anniversary of the opening of Kariba Dam. Um, just out of interest, Stephen, I've been wondering all the while while you're talking. What year were you born? Sixty-seven. Nineteen sixty-seven. Yes, correct. Okay, okay. So, so you're yeah. eleven. You're eleven years younger than me. I was born in fifty-six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that was the thing. <clears throat> Most of the that were above us, they were really young whatever but there was this you know this gap that, that we saw and one of the things that that was at Cranbourne boys they had an honor roll and so all the the boys who who didn't make it and I remember you know looking at this and going wow you know and one of my my big goals growing up first of all like I'm sure many young boys I I wanted to be in the Rhodesian Air Force <clears throat> so I was thinking of that but then my other love was for the why because I had seen so much of it grown up with them. And I was thinking of well, this is before the whole handover and everything that happened in independence. Uh, you know, maybe I'll I'll be an RLI troopy because <clears throat> we were so close with that. Uh one of the things I remember, you know, we would where we lived, <clears throat> the airport wasn't too far from us, which was New Serum as well. So you'd often see, very often see alouettes. You'd often see Canberra's fly over, coming back from missions. I remember the one time, um, one of the hunters, as he came and flew over the city, he did a, a victory roll. And that was so cool because you never really got to see the hunters. Yeah. And and then eventually got to see the uh, the big Bell Huey things, you know, that had started flying that whoop, 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 whoop. That, that made that sound, you know, the Americans definitely would understand that. <clears throat> so all those things, 
you mentioned the Cranbourne Honour Roll. Um, uh, 16 boys from Cranbourne were killed in action during the war. Wow. So, wow. that You see, that's a... And I remember seeing that. And, and, and everybody knew, you know, you get your call-up papers. And my brother was one year shy. So what he want, he was he wanted to join the BSAP, my oldest brother. So he was getting ready to do all that when things went south, basically. And then we uh, made the decision to move. So he didn't go, obviously, because there was not necessary um, for that national service. And um, he just did some odd jobs and stuff like that. But... <clears throat> I just remember the, the separation for children from their dads and stuff like that. And how close, because <clears throat> my dad would call in. Sometimes he would call. I remember the one time he was at Mount Darwin. And the bass was being revved as he was talking to my mom. And we could hear that as he was talking. You could hear, you know, some... A, a couple of explosions, not a lot, and, and you know, bullets or gunfire. So all those kind of things. <clears throat> the other time, my dad uh, told us one of the stories. Unfortunately, he didn't tell us all the stories, and there was no video channel like this back then. But um, they had gone to pick up a, one of the trucks. One of their trucks had been hit by a landmine. So they went to go escort uh, the guys with the tow truck to go pick up this truck that had been, it was one of those fancy ones. What were they called? The crocodiles or something like that. The, you know, the new M wraps that they had. <clears throat> My dad, first of all, the story goes, is he, they were actually placed a lot of mines around the area. And he had actually walked over one of the mines. Then <clears throat> he, he didn't know that of course. And then he went to the side and he was talking to some of the guys that he was over and the tow truck hit a landmine. And as it hit a landmine, there were actually insurgents in the area and they opened fire. And I remember it missed my dad by centimeters. And actually my dad, my brother still has his jacket with a hole through it. So, you know, when you see and hear these kind of things, you know, that, that war situation, it really uh, hits home and, um, you know, it's not just fun and games and you're proud of your dad and all that, which we were, but, you know, you're realizing how dangerous this thing was. Stephen, um, Mark told me that you were yourself um, involved in some serious combat in the South African Army. Um, we've been going for quite a while, so I think it'd be nice if you okay. told us about that. Yeah, tell us about, so about your experiences. Okay, so um, finished school uh, in South Africa as we uh, moved down. In 1983, um, we signed up, you know, uh, whatever you call it, and you get your force number. But I was in that unique situation. I didn't have to do national service. Um, but again, because of my, I wanted to fly. So I tried for a while after matriculating to get into the South African Air Force. That didn't work out. So I said, to my mom, all right, <clears throat> I'm just going to volunteer for the army. And so we went to Pretoria, one of the recruiting offices there, met with a colonel, and he said, well, where do you want to go? And one of the, the decisions, um, South Africa had a very powerful conventional force. So, And at the time, the G5s were uh, in production. So I said I wanted to go to artillery. <clears throat> So within a couple of days after that, um, I was on my way to Potchefstroom, where 10 Artillery Brigade is there. Did my basic training <clears throat> there. I just want to I just want to interrupt you there and say that there was a famous quote by Napoleon. You know, is that God is on the side of the army with the best artillery. <laughs> That's it, and and those are the things you know uh, that really. <laughs> That's why I wanted to go to the artillery because, you know, there were just rumors then in the mid 80s about the power of this new G5 gun because South Africa had the 5.5s five and they had the, the, the 25 pounder, but the, this thing was coming out. <clears throat> and so during basic and second phase, we saw them, right? And we definitely, but I wasn't 
at that time, I wasn't actually assigned to a G5 battery, and I was able to get myself into, <clears throat> there were two G5 batteries in my uh, in the regiment. I was in 14 field artillery. And so I, I was able to get into that. At the time, it was called two medium battery. So we, I got into that. <clears throat> uh, and as a little detour, they offered a course in the rattle, which was the other amazing conventional weapon that the South African Defense Force had. And so I went to the driver's course for that <clears throat> as well, learned how to drive the rattle. And then, um, as well as being part of this G5 battery, then we trained in Uh, you know, started out with a lot of dry drills and all the things that you need to learn about artillery, getting the gun into position, out of position, move quickly, set up. <clears throat> you have different roles. And, you know, the very important thing about artillery is you got to know where you are first before you can shoot somebody. So they had this really uh, fancy um, gyro system, almost like an uh, roughly, it's like an uh, similar that's used in airplanes for, for navigation that the South Africans had. And it'd be, it would be set up behind the, the guns and you get your position in and every gun was, it was surveyed by, by uh, technical assistance with the old lights and everything. So every gun we knew on earth where it was. And that was the amazing thing about the G5 is it's incredible accuracy <clears throat> with the computer knowing where it is and then the sheer power of it uh, being a, a 155 millimeter howitzer with, I believe, a hundred or just under a hundred pound shell <clears throat> that it had. And so we... We would drill all the time, getting in, getting out, setting up and all that. And then we did our first shots in Pachestrum. <clears throat> but then to get that feel for the whole conventional thing, we moved down to Lewatla, which is in the Northern Cape, uh, by uh, where they have their big conventional range. And we spent a few weeks <clears throat> there, uh, first of all, using the guns, um, almost to their full capacity because the guns have charges. <clears throat> so the projectiles are the same, but they have charges for different ranges. So we, instead of just shooting very close, like in Pochestrom, you couldn't shoot more than five kilometers. You know, at, in the Watla, you could start shooting that 20, 25 kilometers. So really beyond visual range where you need the observers and stuff like that. <clears throat> then we got together with what would become uh, six one mechanized battalion uh, in the border, which was infantry, tanks, anti aircraft, and it, so it was a, a very powerful <clears throat> thing to have together. That you had multiple co companies of infantry, tanks. Uh, at the time, uh, South Africa used the Rattle ninety, which was you know the Elands. 90 millimeter gun, but they put it on the rattle. So that would be used as anti-tank and fire suppression. So when they, you know, it was, it was impressive to see, then get everything together. <clears throat> and again, my history was, I realized, uh, you know, my attitude was, Rhodesia was very small units, a lot of counterinsurgency, but here you are training now. And the final few days of the major exercise, we had Mirages, we had Cambras, we had Impalas, you know, you had Alouettes, you had um, the Parabats come in with C-130s and drop, you know, huge amounts of, of paratroopers. So it, it, it was impressive to see the amount of firepower that could be uh, brought to bear. And then, but during this whole time, we knew that there was something going on uh, in Southwest Africa and in, in Angola because a lot of our units started deploying. Uh, a lot of the permanent force guys were going up to the border. And so we got back to Pochestrum and then they said, okay, we had a, a couple of days R&R. &R. And then when we got back, they said, you're going to the border. So we kind of knew that we were going to go to 6-1 uh, 
uh, mechanized, which is in Sumed. <clears throat> but when we got to Vatikluf to get on the C-130s and we get on the planes and we start flying, we all kind of, re you know, the flight attendant uh, said, and the pilot said, oh, we're going to, Ru uh, to uh, Rundu. And we knew a little bit of geography and like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> we got to Rundu uh, in the early afternoon. And what was really interesting is the C-130s were, were very high and then they spiraled down because now this is a border area. So just in case for anti-aircraft. So this is a heck of a roller coaster ride. We landed very confused, which is normally what happens in the army. You hurry up and wait anywhere in the world. And the troopies are always the last to know uh, what's going on. Um, and we cross this big river and he's like, this doesn't make sense. This big river, this is the only river north of Rundu is Angola. And so it turns out we were going to go into this transition camp where we did a little bit of training and the training and briefings that we had were mainly, which was kind of the scary part for us, <clears throat> get used to what they had, meaning the Angolan forces. And the other one that was, is we got gas masks and stuff like that because they had chemical weapons. So that was kind of like a, a shocker for us. After a couple of days there, they told us, okay, you're going to go uh, north. And so we flew, we got, went back to Rundu, got on C-130s and C-160s and flew treetop level to Mavinga. And again, very confusing and everything, get out in the middle of the night because these are night flights because now all of a sudden we have a situation where there's enemy aircraft in the air. We have to be very careful, a lot of light discipline, movement discipline. And they said, okay, they had a bunch of trucks lined up for us. We got on these trucks, drove all night and ended up in um, just south of where the main battle was happening in Quito Carnival. And so uh, we found our battery that we were gonna we were gonna take over from them. They had a few fire missions left, and then they vacated their spots. We took over the G5s, and all of a sudden, it is a surreal situation. We're in a war, and we have uh, MIGs flying over us constantly uh, during daylight hours. So we have to be very careful when we shoot. We used to shoot at that time a lot during a nighttime hours. Um, the FAPLA was deployed all around us. Uh, <clears throat> my battery, if Quito Carnival was here, there was a G5 battery here and a G5 battery here, and we kind of crisscrossed our fire. <clears throat> that way we could cover the whole battle space. Um, uh, what we come to find out later is South Africa kind of didn't have, for lack of a better word, the air superiority that it used to enjoy in the sense that they could use their uh, air force to bomb at will. But because of the power of the G5, um, we could cover that whole battle space very effectively. And so within days, we were in real fire missions and you would hear these missions come in over the radio and they'll say infantry in the open, uh, vehicles on the bridge, because there was this main bridge that we would <clears throat> be attacking. Um, we attacked uh, bombed helicopters that would land in Quito Carnival to pick up their wounded. So we were in that situation where we could cover uh, Quito Carnival. So we... Um, we just got into this rhythm and we hadn't yet been joined by our infantry brothers or the tanks yet. <clears throat> They'd pull back for the new troops to refresh, replenish, get new equipment, fix the new equipment. So basically the artillery there, so it was two G5 batteries, uh, a rocket launcher battery <clears throat> and a 120 millimeter uh, battery that was kind of suppressing upwards of, I think five or six Fopla brigades. Stephen, sorry, just and, to interrupt there. Yes, sir. Sorry, Stephen. Um, just to interrupt. Um, you, what date is this? Is this still eighty-seven? Yes, this is uh, November uh, of eighty-seven. So is this Hooper? Option this Hooper? is the back end of modular, and oh, oh, Hooper okay. kind of started in January. Ah, oh, okay. 
All right. So there was this um, transition period uh, before the infantry and the armor came up. Uh, that was just the artillery was there until just before Christmas when the the infantry and that started to move up. Okay, thanks. And then <clears throat> on your um, in a on a G five, how many? What's the crew made of? Okay, we would you have a number one and your number yes, two. Yes, you have a number yeah. one. That was that was normally the gun commander. Um, so a total of about eight guys. <clears throat> uh, number two, he would be the person who would put in the, um, for lack of a better word, I forget its name now, uh, and actually pull the cord to shoot. <clears throat> the number three would be on sights. He would sit in the place and he would sight the gun after he get commands from the... Um, Okay, so you'd be the fire control, uh, and then you'd have different guys actually handling ammunition. <clears throat> number seven, you know, four, five, and six. Number seven would be the guy in charge of the the charges, oh, and number eight okay. would be the driver uh, normally. Okay. So it's a total of about eight guys, and it fluctuated uh, sometimes if there were casualties or people were sick or whatever the case was. Um, so yeah, that's how. And so the interesting thing with this because of the power of the g5s we did not have to uh move as much and that part of southern angola 400 kilometers maybe from the southwest border um was jungle it was a very dense almost triple canopy uh, thing so you could hide really well <clears throat> and unita was a big part of protecting us and uh because it was there home turf. So we had a lot of UNITA deployed with us. And so uh, we just settled into these different fire missions. Early January, we moved and because then the infantry was with us. And so we had our first big uh, attack with the armor and infantry. And um, that would normally start with, we'd have to push a lot of the artillery rounds and everything to us because we would prep for the infantry guys. And again, we would be almost their close air support, right? Because the mirages would fly in and the buccaneers would fly in and they would um, bomb specific battlefield interdiction, they called us the fancy word for it. <clears throat> and they would take out certain specific targets. But if you had tanks moving or infantry moving to an area or responding to us in a counterattack, then the artillery did its official and this is the beauty of, of South African artillery and the G5 and the G6. And people don't believe us, but I mean, we could shoot at times 40, 45, and I think the best we ever did, 48 kilometers. So you're doing almost 30 miles, which is unheard of, <clears throat> you know, in, in then was modern warfare. And um, so we were totally, and they tried as hard as they would to find us and so you'd have you know the mix flying and all that and so for this first we would have to wait for the weather where it was cloudy low cloud <clears throat> to suppress the mix from flying i forget the actual day it was it was early january <clears throat> it was the first baptism of fire for uh the new um infantry and uh armor guys and we overwhelmed that brigade and then the next one was um, February 14th, was Valentine's Day. And we took on, I believe it was 5-9 uh, Brigade of Fapla. And that was also very successful, <clears throat> completely destroyed that brigade. And you must realize what, what South Africa was able to do there, um, which very similar to the Rhodesians, is with a very small force, we were able to do really amazing things. I think at the height, and you include everybody, truck drivers, etc. there were only 3,000 soldiers deployed in what was called 20 South Africa Brigade. And so that's, that's really nothing compared to, I think they had five or six brigades uh, that they had deployed. And then, you know, because they were losing from modular, they were losing a lot of ground. <clears throat> we started seeing Cubans get involved. And in the MiGs, they had, especially at nighttime, they had um, 
Russians involved because they could fly a little bit better. And you could see the difference between an Angolan so, uh, airman and one of the Cubans or Russian um, pilots. They'd fly a lot lower and they would engage uh, a lot more aggressively with us. And, and that was one of the shortfalls with South Africa is we didn't really have any anti-aircraft. We had to rely <clears throat> on UNITA, which we had by us. Uh, they had stingers that were supplied by the Americans. And then well, our guys, we had um, the Sam 7s. And, um, but we really didn't have a lot of, you know, anti-aircraft power. And so we would have to shut down when the MiGs were flying over. So, um, Fortunately, the, sorry, if I can interrupt there. The, yes, sir. Um, when you had the, um, I'm, I'm guessing the, did you set up a lot of decoys? Um, yes, positions? yes, we did. So did did so, you did you guys also have to do the like actually construct the decoys? Yes. So they would uh, come, and uh, we we did a lot of decoys, and so they would cut down trees and simulate um, the barrels of yeah. um, the the guns. Um, we would. They normally have one gun actually deploy to that dummy position, fire a few rounds so that there was a lot of FAPLA around, you know, the Angolan forces. And so to <clears throat> really authenticate the uh, dummy position. Uh, and then sometimes we would shoot from our mortars, we would shoot maybe one or two rounds of white phosphorus into this dummy position just to have the smoke. And so the MiGs would see that <clears throat> and bomb the hell out of nothing, you know? And okay. so, yeah, there was a lot of decoys that we used and for then, that. Um, did you, did you have issues with like, when you, if you were in a position and you were doing a lot of firing uh, with, with that amount of vegetation around there, didn't you get uh, kind of scarring and things like absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You and got it, scarring. So that was one of the things we would have to do. And especially, our UNITA allies is we'd have to cut down brush in front of the guns and put down fresh brush. <clears throat> and that's sometimes why we had to move positions because the scarring uh, would be so great because the, again, the force of that G5 is incredible. That it, it just like a flamethrower out the front of it and it scorched the earth literally. So yes, we would have to put down branches and stuff like that in front of it <clears throat> to camouflage it. And then, after a couple of weeks, we didn't have to move much, which was really very fortunate because of the terrain. It's a very deep sand there. There's no bedrock or whatever. And so it was very difficult to move the guns. So it was good that we were able to stay in a position for a while <clears throat> and then have uh, to move it. And um, then were you like living in foxholes? And yes. Trenches constantly? <clears throat> okay. And we, we, we call them casas which is, you know, Spanish and or Portuguese for little house. And so uh, what we learned to do is, number one, a foxhole, but you had to have a bunker because they would return fire and the MiGs were very dangerous. <clears throat> so you need something over the top. So we would either use um, branches or um, the, the cases and the containers of the G5 um, charges and put that above and pack sand around it and it became very secure um, to take damage if if that you know that would happen um the rockets were actually that they had were some of the the most dangerous things that we encountered you know the bm21 yeah yeah stalin organ is they used to call it right that, that that was pretty scary because you know the the shrapnel which actually hit my truck the one time uh, on, on the tire. It took took out the front tire. Um, and I, I think my brother still has it, my uncle has it, a sliver of the rocket that, that was punctured. Uh, so the, those were the kind of things that, you know, you had to, to really be aware of. <clears throat> we didn't have so much, because of the UNITA, we had a lot of UNITA deployed as well. And so we didn't have to worry so much about you know, hand-to-hand -hand type fighting, especially for artillery. We, we had to, yeah. you know, concentrate on the guns <clears throat> and to pay attention with that. Um, so so we could fire the guns any time of the day, 24-7, 
for five months we were we were active you know shooting and all that so were you were you right up there for like five months or did you absolutely and you, yeah, you, we were, you didn't pull yeah. back to Mavingo no. or anything like that. So you're no. wow. We were yeah. That was the new unique thing about the artillery, especially that first few weeks. <clears throat> we were the only ones there, um, and the, the, the infantry would normally just uh, they didn't retreat too much, uh, and I won't call it retreat. They wouldn't withdraw too much. Anyway, they were always around us after they came up <clears throat> because they uh, and then they would re refit and rearm and stuff like that. But yeah, we were there for five months, uh, deployed there. And we got to a point which, like so many things that happen, the higher-ups make decisions, and that means political decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, people say that the South African Defense Force, um, we were defeated there. Well, our goal was never to take Quito Carnival. Our goal <clears throat> from the very beginning, they told us, you know, troopies don't get told much. But what we were told was just to stop the annual migration southwards of the Angolan forces to take Mavinga and Jamba, which was yeah. Unita's stronghold. And we completely annihilated them and pushed them back hundreds of kilometers. So, <clears throat> And there's always this argument that, you know, should we have taken... We didn't want to take Quito Carnival, yeah. right? We could have if we wanted to. Because, you know, the famous 3-2 battalion, they actually, in February, they went around on the western side. And they did a bunch of, with the South African recce's, they mined and rocketed Manong, which was their big air base. So if we yeah. wanted to, we could have done, I, I think it was just a holding place for these negotiations that, that had to happen, you know. And <clears throat> we were... At least in our minds, as young troopies, we were never defeated. We were never out of our. Yeah, we, we were invincible, right? <laughs> who was um, when you would receive like your fire missions? Who was calling that in? We had um, our own uh, artillery observers, so um, normally officers and some NCOs that were trained to call in fire. <clears throat> so in the in that area. It was predominantly um, artillery observers. <clears throat> if there was a special target or something like that, it would normally be um, the South African recce. They would infiltrate into a very sp specific area, you know, because of their training and their ability to get into very tight areas. Um, they would get in, call in fire missions, and then get out. And and I've since heard amazing stories that they were these two man teams in five recce, and they were trained by the Rhodesians, uh, you know, like Chris Schulenberg, you know, was one of the Rhodesian heroes, um, and they were these recce were trained by them to work in these small teams to get into these special areas, and do uh, these very special fire missions that were required. But m for the predominance, it was our own uh, observers. Mm -hmm. And from, from your positions, were you ever able to see, like, the infantry assaults in the distance? No, we were no. too – yeah, the distance was too far back. <clears throat> they were, you know, uh, the one time maybe they were maybe 10, 15 kilometers in front of us. So we saw it and heard it because we were part of it. But, you know, you could hear the tank fire and the rifles and stuff like that. But, no, we, we were never <clears throat> able to actually see that. Uh, action for lack of a better word but we were definitely um involved in all their operations that they were in. and then did, did you have was there like any kind of counter battery fire at you from from their <clears throat> artillery yes they did they have the uh, soviet m46 which could shoot probably 30 kilometers and so and then the and then the the they would send up maybe one BM-21 and they'd push them really far forward <clears throat> and they would try to do counter battery. And some of it sometimes was close. Uh, I mean, I remember driving up to the battery the one time and uh, my truck got airlocks. So I was busy bleeding it. And I heard that, you know, the whistling sound and they were shooting at the battery, which was about maybe a kilometer or two in front of me. 
and the rounds were exploding around where I was because they would overshoot. <clears throat> and so, again, the UNITA infantry really was able to push them back so that they couldn't have those forward observers. They would guess where we were. <clears throat> and one of the cool um, little things of war the one time, um, they understood, and that's why I said we used white phosphorus in our positions, they understood if they saw smoke, that's where they, you know, the G5s were. And they had a lot of energy expended to try and get the G5s. <clears throat> so we picked up on this and our observers knew where their um, one artillery battery was. So we fired white phosphorus into their battery when the MiGs were overhead and the MiGs, the Angolan MiGs actually attacked their own battery. So you know, that's one of those little things where we were sneaky and we, we used the Angolan Air Force to our advantage. And then how did it how did it finish for you? You had pulled back? So after that deployment, uh, we came back. We had R&R for a, a few weeks. <clears throat> and then they flew us back to Southwest Africa. The 6-1 mechanized uh, base was in Omatia, which is um, by the big places like Oshikati, and Ndongwa, those places that we know in Southwest Africa. So we went there. We were there for a few weeks. The Eastern Front, as we called it, uh, quietened down. Um, one of our sister batteries, <clears throat> G5s, went back. The r and they went back there. And it was a lot of what you were talking about earlier, a lot of dummy smoke and mirror stuff. And they'd move the guns around a lot. But then the Cubans got very aggressive on what we call this Western Front. Um, yeah. And they were moving very aggressively yeah, towards Southwest Africa. The, we got brand new guns. <clears throat> Our guns were wore out. So we got brand new, eight brand new guns. We refitted, rearmed, and they said, okay, six were mechanized. And we need you to be deployed to Ruakana, <clears throat> which is west. They have a dam there called Kalawek. And uh, so we deployed there. Three, two battalion joined us. And Parabats joined us. Parabats then became our uh, protection element. We had a, uh, a company of Parabats to protect us. They really got incredibly aggressive. So what South Africa started doing was pushing just to see where they were because we didn't, that whole landscape there is like a land. It's flat, That's it's open, you know, so you cannot hide like we were on the Eastern side. <clears throat> so we had to find out where they were. So I remember one of the things we did was we sent up uh, weather balloons from the artillery with chafe, just like World War II. Yep. <clears throat> and to kind of see where their um, anti-aircraft artillery, and they had amazing anti -air. I believe after the fact we heard that, you know, South uh, the Angolan, it was probably the most heavily defended uh, airspace uh, up to that point, since, you know, World War II and then, you know, maybe Vietnam and Hanoi and stuff like that. Well, then again, now, you know, in, in, in Desert Storm in, for those days, it was, you know, I mean, just wall to wall anti-aircraft. <clears throat> so I remember they, they sh and we deployed the guns and we saw the missiles coming up from all over the place. And we got busy very quickly, neutralized a bunch of those uh, missiles. And then we moved forward because we heard they were coming to a town called Techipa. We had an, an, a lot of now, it, we were clashing a lot with the Cubans now, not, not uh, FAPLA uh, anymore. And we had infantry, you know, having, you know, full-blown attacks with them, moving back. And so the artillery was supporting that. And then um, one of our last big missions was to bomb the base in Techipa. And it was incredibly successful. I, I think we, the numbers was about 300 Cubans that we killed that night, up to and including one of their generals. And so we started coming back because then it was like kicking a hornet's nest and they came at us with everything. And that's when um, their MiGs attacked basically Southwest Africa, the Kalawek project, the, the dam. Mm -hmm. So that day we were moving back and we leapfrogging backwards. 
we would, you know, some of the guns would shoot and then cover the other guns and cover the artillery, cover the tanks. And um, that's when the, the MiGs came over. And uh, what was strange for us is we saw them coming from the south and we thought, yeah, those mirages, but they, they were too big. And next minute, you know, we just start seeing these, you know, these bombs, they look like a VW Beetle when they come off the, those things, they're huge. Yeah. Um, and they started bombing that, that area where there were South African uh, soldiers. And my friend and I, we had actually gone to see one of these uh, new um, anti-tank missile systems that they put on the rattle. We were busy looking at that when the strike came in. And um, so we had no foxhole, no nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> and we just looked at each other like a bunch of knuckleheads smiling at each other. And these guys, I mean, they were bombing maybe 100 meters away from us. The bombs were exploding. And um, then they came back around. And when that happened, we kind of, the shock, and we started returning fire. We had, you know, some anti-aircraft fire. People were shooting individual weapons and all that. And actually, one of the MiGs was hit, and it crashed, landed. But then we, we leapfrogged back into Okana, which is right by the border. I mean, it's right there, you know, meters away. And then, basically, the whole thing was, you know, again, politics to get the upper hand. Yeah. And that was it. That was the end of South Africa's Bush War. That was the end of the border conflict. They started implementing uh, the United Nations Resolution. <clears throat> we were still deployed there in mass. Mm. We had a lot of citizen force soldiers come up from South Africa, and they were deployed there. And it was just a lot of, you know, posturing and power play and stuff like that. Again, a lot of decoys. Our our battery was actually split by about as much as 50 kilometers. There was one troop closer to Arakana, and we were by Ogongo, my troop, a uh, Gulf yeah. troop. <clears throat> And then that was it. It was it was the end. We started withdrawing, and in December of '88, um, we, we we got out of you know national service. Yeah. And that was the end of that was the end of it for everybody. It was yeah. The end of the border yeah. the border war. Yeah. There's, there was the there was the the flare up again in April '89. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, but uh, there was no army units then. It was all Kufut that were, that handled that. Yeah, uh, there was. They, yeah, yeah, there was very little in the way of the the conventional yeah. structure that we had yeah. had in South Africa, yeah. for, in Southwest Africa, for many years. I mean, the, yeah. so, uh, but then that was it, and and <clears throat> kind of goes to that earlier point. You get to the point where you won all the battles. It seemed like you lost the war. Yeah, you know, you, you were the superior. In so many engagements, you know, as Rhodesia was back then. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're told, well, you know, this is over and we're going to, well, whatever you got, we're handing over to this yeah. new government. Yeah. And that's the way it worked. You know, yeah. so that, that, that was our story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was, it was um, bittersweet again yeah. to, to go through that same emotions now as, a, as a, a young man in his 20s you know and now married and stuff like that with a child and thinking my gosh we here we are again you know we we, we did all this and was it for naught yeah well i think yeah. on that note we better wrap up guys um, <laughs> yeah yes no problem well steven thank that's you. like an incredible story and uh thank you so much brother um you've you've added to the tapestry of the Rhodesian history and uh, and Southern African history. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for putting this all thank together. You.